Hey guys and welcome back for another episode of my midweek mystery series where today I want to share with you the case of Lauren Spearer who went missing on a night out with friends in 2011 and just over a decade on there are still no real clues as to what happened to her. This was one of the highest profile missing persons cases in America at the time but still the publicity just didn't turn up the right answers. The family are still desperate for any leads or information and are still actively searching for Lauren, refusing to give up until they have the answer. This is one of those cases where someone, possibly more than one person, knows exactly what happened to her. And the more awareness we can raise about her story, the more likely the right person is to hear it. As posters said at the time, anything small could be big. I've been following this case for quite a while and I do believe this case can still be solved, it's never too late. And this is absolutely not considered to be a cold case, the investigation is alive and well. This is the kind of case I could make a 3 hour long video about going down every rabbit hole, detailing every tiny thing. There are so many potential theories here that I could spend hours speculating about. But during my time talking about true crime on YouTube, I've come to realise that speculation helps no one, it just makes the water murkier. Speculating is the job of the investigators, my job is to share the story as it is. In this video I'm going to be sharing the facts of the case as well as what we're pretty sure we do know, and then I'll cover a few of the theories that it seems investigators have looked into most thoroughly, but I'm not going to be going down any rabbit holes. But let's begin this by taking a look at who Lauren was. Lauren Spira was born on the 17th of January 1991 to her parents Charlene and Robert Spira in Scarsdale, New York, which is also where she grew up. If Lauren was alive today, she would have been turning 30 earlier this year. She still had so much life ahead of her and somebody tore that away and that person is still living with no consequences. Lauren attended Edgemont High School in Greenville, New York and graduated in 2009 before going on to enrol at Indiana University where she was studying textiles and merchandising. She was also quite heavily involved with the Jewish community at her university. She was Jewish and proud and her family belonged to Scarsdale Synagogue and once at university she continued attending Jewish meetings, even spending her last spring break planting trees in Israel on behalf of the Jewish National Fund. Lauren has been described by friends and family as bubbly and outgoing with plenty of friends. She would always fit in no matter where she was and she had this zest for life. The findlauren.com website, which is run by family members, has a section where friends and family can share their memories of her. And these read, thank you for raising such an amazing person who has impacted my life in ways that words can't describe. I will love her forever, I will never stop. Not a day goes by that I don't think about Lauren, her smile, her pep and her zest for life. I could tell right away that she was a fun, uplifting and generous person. An Indianapolis Monthly article tells the story of how after Lauren disappeared, Lauren's mother Charlene received a letter from the mother of a girl Lauren grew up with, who also ended up going to Indiana University. This woman said how her daughter had always been jealous of how popular Lauren was growing up, but when the daughter started to struggle, Lauren immediately reached out and helped her. That was the kind of person she was. Lauren Spira was just 20 years old when she disappeared on the 3rd of June 2011. A sophomore at college, she was on a night out with friends at Kilroy Sports Bar in Bloomington, which is this small college town, when she seemingly vanished into thin air. No trace of her has ever been found since. The night in question began in the very early hours of June 3rd. Lauren had plans for a fun night out with her friends and it's reported that Lauren left her apartment where she lived with a roommate around 12.30am with her friend David Roan. Together the two head to their other friend's house, Jason Rosenbaum, known as Just Jay, and he lived in an apartment a few blocks away. Once there, Lauren met up with Jay's neighbour and one of her friends, Corey Rossman. Lauren and Corey had actually only just met a few days beforehand at an Indianapolis 500 race, but they got on and it seems like the group had pre-drinks together at Jason's apartment 
before heading off to a local sports bar called Kilroy's at around 2am. Being 20 years old, Lauren was underage and therefore she had to use a fake ID to gain entry to the bar. Sources all seem to have a different recollection of whether Lauren arrived at the bar by herself or with Corey, but what we do know for sure is that Lauren actually only ended up spending just over half an hour at the bar in total before leaving with Corey, as was captured on surveillance cameras. Somehow she managed to leave the bar without both her mobile phone and her shoes, which should give you an idea as to how intoxicated she was. Apparently she'd taken off her shoes when she walked out the bar onto the patio which was covered in sand and this was quite a normal thing to do when you were at this bar, you always took your shoes off to go outside because you didn't want them getting all sandy, so this isn't considered really to be anything weird. Lauren just hadn't put them back on again before she left. From there, Corey walks with Lauren back to her apartment complex, Smallwood Plaza, and together they enter the building and catch the lift up to the fifth floor. When they stepped out of the lift into the hallway, there were four other men there, all other students at the university who lived in the apartment complex. It's said that one of the men, Zach Oaks, asked if Lauren was okay as she was noticeably very drunk, to which Corey said, she is okay, I got it. Oakes then told Corey that he should take Lauren home, at which point Corey, who I'm assuming was also pretty drunk, swore at him. Maybe frustration because Corey was taking Lauren home, maybe just drunkenness, men getting rowdy, we don't really know. But a small altercation ensued and Zach ended up punching Corey in the head. And this is important because Corey has claimed since then that the punch has caused him a concussion and they subsequently lost all memory of the night in question. For whatever reason, the two then decide not to go to Lauren's apartment even though they were basically outside of it. They both leave the building. By this point it's nearing 3am and they decide to head back to Corey's apartment instead which is only just a few blocks away. Only Lauren is still barefoot and she falls down twice. To get to Corey's apartment, the two have to cross through an alleyway and surveillance cameras captured them leaving said alleyway at 2.51am. What exactly happened in this alleyway isn't entirely clear but for some reason Lauren's keys and handbag were left there. An episode by ABC on the disappearance of Lauren mentions that because she was falling down so much and not wearing shoes, Corey decided to pick her up in a fireman's carry and carry her the rest of the way to the apartment. However, I don't think he was carrying her in the surveillance footage I just mentioned. I didn't see that mentioned specifically anywhere. Corey's later attorney has said that after Corey was hit, Lauren had to help him walk back to his apartment as he wasn't in a good way. But Lauren's parents have said, would you be able to carry someone through an alley if you were 4 foot 11 and weighed 90 pounds? No way, Lauren wasn't very strong. Clearly nothing bad happened in this alleyway, they weren't in there very long and surveillance footage shows them exiting absolutely fine. But at some point in there, Lauren put her things down for whatever reason. To either help Corey, or so he could help her I'm assuming, but we don't know which way around it was. This surveillance footage was the last time Lauren was captured on camera. Soon, the two arrived at Corey's apartment and they shared with his roommate, Michael Beth. Michael, who was completely sober and had stayed in that night to study for a final exam, has since said that Corey was incredibly drunk and stumbling, possibly also concussed, and actually ended up throwing up on the stairs, so Michael had to escort him to bed. Michael said that he saw that Lauren wasn't in a good way either and tried to convince her to stay over, but she wasn't interested, so instead he walks her down two doors to the house of Jay Rosenbaum, whose house it was they had pre-drank at. From what I can gather, Lauren and Jay had been friends for quite a while, having met at a summer camp many years beforehand, so they were pretty close. Michael probably thought that Jay was better to look after her than him. Jay did take Lauren in and once again tried to convince her to stay at his and sleep on the couch. And it does seem like she may have dozed off for a bit before deciding that she was going to go home. Despite his apparent protests, she leaves and at 4.30am, Jay watches her walk up the street towards the intersection at 11th Avenue and College Street. From there, Lauren disappeared. She never arrived back at Smallwood Plaza. 
There were no surveillance cameras to capture this last journey of hers, so we've just got to take Jay at his words, which of course has been questioned extensively over the following years, but we'll talk more about that later. Jay said in a later police report that he noticed that Lauren had a bruise under her eye, but when he asked how she got it, she says she didn't know. He claims that as Lauren walked away, he shouted out to her to text him when she got home, but she had no phone, she'd left it at the bar. Of course, this also means investigators have never been able to use phone towers or pings to figure out Lauren's last movements. It also seems that Jay wasn't alone in his home that night either, with visitors staying. Jay's attorney would later tell the Indianapolis Monthly, there were other people around and I believe the police have all their names and information, but we don't know that. It wouldn't be long until people started to figure out that Lauren had gone missing. She had a boyfriend called Jesse Wolf, who she'd met at the same summer camp where she'd met Jay all those years earlier, and the two had been in a relationship for around two years. According to everyone who knew them, they were a happy couple and the love between them was clear. On the morning of the 3rd of June, Jesse is texting Lauren trying to get in contact with her, but he isn't hearing anything back. Then he finally got a reply, but not from Lauren, from an employee at the bar saying that she'd left her phone there. That's when Jesse starts to get concerned and gets in contact with Lauren's roommate. Jesse was also a student at Indiana University at the time, so he wasn't too far away, and so he decides to contact Hadar Tamir, Lauren's roommate, to meet her on campus and get the keys to the apartment so he can go and check on Lauren himself. Only, of course, Lauren wasn't at the apartment. It's at that point that Lauren's report is missing to the police, although sources differ as to whether it was Jesse or other friends that made the report. Jesse would later say that he spent the night Lauren went missing at home, watching the NBA final before going to bed at around 2.30am. His father would say that the two of them were texting about the game as it went on, and Jesse's roommate would also back up his story. He didn't leave his flat that night. The Spears received a call in the late afternoon of June 3rd from their other daughter, Rebecca, telling them that Lauren had been reported as missing to the Bloomington police. Robert, her father, immediately calls Jesse to find out what's going on, and his wife starts calling hospitals and clinics in the area to see if anyone matching Laura's description has been admitted. The very next day, the parents arrive in Bloomington, and the Herald Times runs the first of many stories about Laura's disappearance. It wasn't long until different media outlets were at every corner of the small town. Everyone jumped into action to spread the story and search for Lauren. Within a week, the family had made a Facebook page called Missing Lauren Spearer, and it started to grow in followers. Within a couple of days, volunteers from Bloomington and all across the local area aided in a hunt for her. Daily searches went on for weeks. Many celebrities started to retweet stories of her disappearance on Twitter. They really got the word out. On June 7th, a press conference was held at the Bloomington Police Headquarters with Lieutenant Bill Parker, who would become the face of the investigation, saying, When somebody at 4.30 in the morning, no shoes and has earlier been drinking, goes out and then just disappears off a street corner, we feel like there certainly could be foul play involved. A search warrant was also bought for the building surveillance footage that very day. Also, something which people will do find very interesting is that it's that same day that Jay Rosenbaum hired an attorney. He'd already given two statements to the police at this point, he'd shown them around where he'd last seen Lauren, and he shared his phone. Then he lawyered up. Now this is something of a point of contention in this case. All of the last men to see Lauren lawyered up incredibly quickly, which I'm sure you agree can look very suspicious. If they've got nothing to hide, why would they need lawyers? But in reality, lawyering up doesn't say anything at all. It's actually probably the smart thing to do, even if you're innocent. You know as the last male to see Lauren, Jay Rosenbaum was going to be looked at very closely. If I knew of somebody in a situation similar to this, the first thing I would advise them to do would be get a lawyer. The fact that all the men, so Jay, Corey and Michael all hired lawyers 
isn't an illustration of their guilt or innocence. However, it has also been said that they've not been too cooperative from the very beginning of the investigation. They naturally deny this and say they've helped with everything they can, but the lawyers kind of put up a stone wall. By June 9th, police announced they had their first person of interest in this case, but they wouldn't reveal who this person was. Although it does seem like it was Corey Rossman and Lauren's boyfriend, Jesse Wolfe. On June 11th, America's Most Wanted as a segment about Lauren's disappearance, which would lead to hundreds of tips coming in. Searchers also came to Bloomington on horseback to aid with the search. By June 10th, one week since the disappearance, Lauren's parents had offered a $100,000 reward for any information leading to their daughter, and a lake on the outskirts of town had been searched to no avail. On June 13th, there was another press conference in which the spokesman was asked about rumours circulating around Lauren's drug use, and a rumour that she may have OD'd and other students may have disposed of her body in a panic. The spokesman confirmed that they had heard such rumours. But what exactly were these? Well, it's not entirely clear whether Lauren's bad state that night was due to just alcohol or drugs as well or whether those drugs were intentionally consumed or if a drink had been spiked. Obviously, we don't have Lauren here to confirm her story, so everything on this point is just conjecture and the word of others. I also had to keep reminding myself throughout the research for this video that Lauren lived in the USA, where the drinking age is 21. But even being drunk at the age of 20, she was underage drinking, and that is something which seems to have skewed a lot of public opinion about this case, even though she was a university student. Lauren had even been arrested for public intoxication nine months prior to her disappearance. Witnesses state that not only was Lauren drinking to excess on the night in question, but she was also seen doing drugs. According to Jay's initial statement, either Lauren or David stated that they had taken drugs prior to arriving at his apartment. Cocaine and crushed up clonopin tablets, which is an anti-anxiety drug. In the aftermath of Lauren's disappearance, a small amount of cocaine was found in her bedroom, and Jessie's parents would go public, stating that Lauren had a serious drug problem. Whether or not everything they say is true, I really don't know. There has been a lot of anger between the Spears and the Wolves over the years, with the Spears saying to the Journal News, We are appalled that the Wolves have defamed our daughter knowing that Lauren will never have the opportunity to respond. Whilst the Wolves have said that the Spears won't leave their son alone, lying about his level of cooperation and lumping him in with the other three men involved in this case. Nadine Wolfe, Jessie's mum, has said, This poor little girl is not with us today because of her drug abuse. If Jessie was guilty of anything, he was guilty of taking care of Lauren, who had some serious drug issues. She would abuse to the point where she would black out. Jessie always threatened to call and tell her parents, and she said, If you do, I'll break up with you. The one night she went out without him and did what she did, unfortunately cost her her life. They also claim that Lauren was previously kicked out of a summer camp due to her drug abuse, but there's no actual proof of this. How true all of this is, we really don't know. It could be true, it could be Jesse's parents just desperately trying to protect their son and his image. From what we do know, it does seem like Lauren did do drugs. A lot of people have said that she did, but we don't know about the true extent of her drug use nor do we know if it was the drug use that was responsible for her death or disappearance that night. On the same thread, there's also lots of rumours that Lauren could have been spiked whilst at the bar that night. You see, Lauren suffered with a heart condition called Long QT Syndrome, which is, according to the Mayo Clinic, a heart rhythm condition that can potentially cause fast, chaotic heartbeats. The rapid heartbeats can cause you to suddenly faint, and in some cases, it can cause sudden death. As you can probably imagine, somebody with such a condition probably shouldn't be doing drugs such as cocaine, which can cause an increased heart rate in itself. Clonopin can also cause increased heartbeats or pounding heartbeats. Because Long QT has no external signs, unless Lauren decided to share her medical history with people, they wouldn't have any idea that she had this. 
As Charlene Spearer said in an interview with ABC in 2016, Lauren didn't make wise choices that night, but she didn't make herself disappear. Lauren may have been a bit reckless, but so many of us are at certain points in our life. Most of us don't end up mysteriously disappearing when we decide to experiment in college. The lack of answers in this case eventually led the Spearers to hire their own private investigators and set up the findlauren.com website through which people could send in their own tips. It was through this website that the family received a tip about a man called Corey Hammersley, another Corey, and he was also an inmate at an Indiana state prison who himself had gotten deep in the drug scene of Indiana University. About a year after Lauren's disappearance, it's said that Hammersley got high and had a meltdown. He stepped out of his apartment wearing nothing but a hat and with a gun in his hand and starts shooting randomly into a house. No one was hurt luckily, but when the police arrived he also opened fire on them and subsequently got a 24 year prison sentence. It's alleged that whilst behind bars, another inmate said they were playing cards together when Lauren's photo appeared on the TV in the room. Hammersley looked up and said, Man, I knew the guys that did that. He shared a story of how Lauren died at a house party with a group of unidentified students who were all drinking and doing ecstasy. She OD'd, they got scared and threw her body in the Ohio River. Hammersley was later interviewed about this and when asked if he helped move the body, he denied it, but said that he didn't want to be associated with the case any further. As you can guess, the guys suspected to be involved in this cover-up are Corey Rossman, Michael Beth and Jay Rosenbaum. The rumour goes that Lauren did OD and in a moment of panic they disposed of the body and have had to cover it up ever since, leaving the people who loved Lauren with no answers. I didn't find much speculation that these boys had actually been responsible for her death, nobody really thinks that they outright murdered her, but that they just covered up what did happen. Although it is worth noting that cadaver dogs did search a home and they picked up on nothing. People were already suspicious of the men's accounts of that night, but when this tip came in, it just further compounded these suspicions. Drugs combined with Lauren's heart condition made it very believable. Ever since, Corey Rossman, Jay Rosenbaum and Michael Beth have been under the lens of suspicion. As I mentioned previously, all three lawyered up pretty quickly and have never been all too cooperative with the police, at least according to the Spearers. All three refused to sit lie detector tests by the Bloomington police because they didn't trust them, however they did later sit FBI administered polygraph tests and from what I can gather, they passed. DNA samples were also collected from all three men. Robert Spearer later told Indianapolis Monthly, We've met with two of the boys, Jay and Jesse. One of the other boys flat out refuses to speak with us or to the private investigators, and that's Corey Rossman. In April 2012, Corey said to Indianapolis Monthly himself, If you have some way to prove my name won't be slandered and what I say actually gets across, and I'm not portrayed in the terrible light the lying slanderous people connected to this case have portrayed me in, then I'd consider talking to you. Otherwise, I have nothing to say and you can refer all questions to my lawyer, Carl Saltzman. I must admit, I have real mixed feelings about this whole thing. If these men are innocent, then it's awful that they're under suspicion for what they are. It must be a horrible feeling knowing that you're going to look suspicious no matter what you do. If they are guilty, I obviously have little sympathy. But until Laura's body is found, we won't have an answer there. If they are telling the truth, then they're at best just shitty friends. I'd like to think my male friends or female friends saying that wouldn't let me leave the house at 4.30 in the morning to walk home alone whilst incredibly drunk. Maybe they're guilty of nothing other than having a slip of judgement and letting Lauren walk home alone. At worst, we're dealing with people who covered up her death. As I mentioned earlier, Jesse was also a person of interest. He's not suspected to be a part of the overdose and hiding body theory, but it's been noted that he helped with the search for only the first two days before his parents came down to Bloomington to take him home. Whilst he also wouldn't take a polygraph test with Bloomington police, his parents have claimed that he did complete a private one. 
All we really have when it comes to Jesse being a person of interest is speculation. People claiming that maybe he got jealous of Lauren hanging around with other men, that she'd lied to him and told him that she was going to bed before going out, etc. But his roommate does confirm that he was home that night and there's no actual evidence to prove that Jesse did anything to harm Lauren or even saw her that night. It's not completely out of the question that everything maybe did happen exactly as Michael, Corey and Jay said it had that night. That Lauren walked off alone at 4.30am as Jay shouted for her to text him once she got home. Something that was never going to happen as she didn't have her phone on her. And then someone else came past. An opportunist who saw an inebriated petite woman walking alone on the side of the road and took their chance. If that's the case, then the person responsible for Laura's disappearance really could be anyone. Likely someone local for them to be driving around this area in the early hours of the morning, someone who knew the area well enough to know where to hide a body and it not be found for a decade. I think there's just as much chance of that being the case here than anything else. There's reports from a man who was a bar manager in the local area that he saw a mystery man throw an intoxicated woman matching Lauren's description over his shoulder near 10th Street and College Avenue. The police did look into this but couldn't find video evidence to support the witness's timeline. He said this happened around 3.38am. But the timeline may well be wrong here. As I mentioned earlier, a video made by ABC News did say that Corey threw Lauren over his shoulder to sort of get her back to his house, so that may well have been what they saw, but the time frame just doesn't quite match up. There's also reports coming from a homeless man that he heard a woman scream at around 4.35am, just west of where Lauren was last seen. Whilst a reporter from the Bloomington Herald Times looked into this claim, it's not known if investigators ever followed up on it. And to add another layer to this mystery, it's speculated that this homeless guy was a guy called Franklin Rosedog Crawford, who actually died just a few days after Lauren disappeared. Coincidence or not? This abduction theory was also further rumoured when reports of a white truck, a mid-2000s four-door white Chevrolet Silverado or Colorado, circling the area that night came to light. The truck in question was captured on CCTV driving around the block at the time and location that Lauren was last seen. They appealed for the owners of this truck to come forward and soon they discovered an interesting lead. A man called James McClish had recently been released from prison where he'd been held for assaulting his ex-wife. He was living in a halfway house about 10 minutes from where Lauren disappeared and drove a very similar white truck. The lead came from a woman who called in, claiming that McClish had killed Lauren and then buried her on a farm in southern Indiana, alleging that he'd made comments alluding to her murder. Although this white truck lead was fairly quickly dismissed by investigators and the driver was ruled out as a suspect by 20th of June 2011, in 2016, ABC News did a polygraph test with James McClish. He was found to be telling the truth in regards to Lauren's disappearance, saying, I wish you guys the best of luck, I do. But why was this truck ruled out so quickly by police? I assume that the actual driver came forward, but I couldn't see that actually spelled out anywhere in any of my sources, but it's very interesting. As the years went on, the investigation didn't come to an end. As I said, this is still not considered a cold case. They are still actively looking for Lauren. In January 2016, the Bloomington Police Department, along with federal agents, conducted further investigative work, following up on tips. Search warrants were executed at a property in Martinsville, which is about 20 and a half miles north of Bloomington. However, anything they discovered from this search was ruled to remain hidden from the public unless criminal charges were filed, which they never were. So we still don't know what, if anything, was found at this property, nor do we really know why the property was searched. Some evidence was removed from the scene and a white truck was one of those things, but we still don't know exactly why. The property was owned by the family of a man called Justin Wages, who was in jail at the time. He had a past of violence against women and a frequent habit of exposing himself to women and children. Nine different cases of exposure, actually. 
Whilst we can assume investigators had enough suspicion to search Wages' house, we still don't know exactly what that was. We can assume they didn't find anything substantial though because nothing really ever came of it. But then in 2017, another potential theory about Lauren's disappearance came to light. In April 2015, another Indiana University student, 22-year-old Hannah Wilson, was murdered under circumstances eerily similar to Lauren's disappearance. Hannah had been on a night out with friends on a Thursday night as a celebration because she just aced her last exam. She started out at home before heading to the bars in Bloomington. Around midnight, the group ended up at Kilroy Sports Bar, the very same bar Lauren had been in on the night she disappeared. But worried that Hannah had had a bit too much to drink, in the early hours of Friday morning, her friends put her in a taxi and paid the driver $20 to take her home, which was only six blocks away. The taxi driver later said that he left her at the intersection near her house and watched her walk away, and Hannah's roommate heard her arrive home at around 1am. Phone records showed that she connected to the home's Wi-Fi just a few minutes after this. Hannah did make it home that night without a doubt. But then just seven and a half hours later, just after 8.30 a.m., her body was found in a grassy area about 10 miles north of Bloomington. Her cause of death was blunt force trauma and it's thought that the murder weapon was a maglite flashlight. At the crime scene, investigators found a mobile phone resting between her shoes, which they of course initially believed to be hers. Only it wasn't. The phone belonged to her killer, 49-year-old Daniel Messel. Messel was already known to the police at this time as he had an extensive criminal history, mostly for violence against women. At one point he went to prison for assaulting his own grandmother. When investigators swiftly turned up at his house, they found his SUV packed ready for a trip away and a bag filled with blood-soaked clothes, Hannah's blood. In the centre console of the car, they also found about 50 strands of Hannah's hair. Messel was arrested on the spot and charged with first-degree murder. CCTV footage later showed Messel cruising up and down Bloomington's Main Street in his car, a Kia Sportage, and it's believed that he was cruising the street specifically for a victim, a student who'd had too much to drink, easy prey. But Hannah was put in a taxi by her friends and she definitely made a home that night. So how did Messel manage to take her? It's believed to be partly luck or unluck. Messel must have followed her home and after Hannah got inside her house, she realised she had dropped something, maybe her licence. So she headed back out onto the street to find it. And it was then that Messel pounced, getting her into his car. It's thought that Messel intended to drive Hannah to a remote area about 15 miles outside of Bloomington, but ran into a hurdle when he realised that the bridge leading to his destination was out. Hannah had been knocked out in the car, but she regained consciousness and fought for her life. Messel then pulled the car over and killed her to stop Hannah escaping. At some point in the struggle, it seems that Hannah might have managed to get his phone off him and that was all of the evidence investigators would later need. Or he was just the world's stupidest killer and accidentally left his phone at the scene. He was, of course, found guilty of her murder. As his trial went on, more and more women came forward accusing Messel of assaulting them. There were a variety of allegations around stalking, assault and rape. There was a whole house of female students who said that Messel had terrorised them. This was a pattern, he was a habitual creep. Could it be possible that this is the same man who could be responsible for the disappearance and murder of Lauren Spira? It matches his MO here, maybe he was cruising the streets once again on that night in June 2011 when he happened to come across Lauren. I really don't think this is out of the realm of possibility, but of course there's no evidence linking the two. A man called David Hayden did contact Crime Watch Daily with a 23-page letter claiming that he'd helped Messel move Lauren's body, and they'd met during prison time together in the 90s. He wrote in the letter that Lauren was dressed in black stretch yoga pants, a white shirt, dark thong, no bra, and several rings on one hand. 
Lauren was indeed wearing clothes similar to this. But then again, what she was wearing on the night in question has been publicly advertised, so there's no way of knowing how he knew this information, maybe he'd just seen it on the posters. Messel denies all involvement in Lauren's disappearance, and as far as I can find, Bloomington police have never officially declared him a suspect. However, the Brown County prosecutor has said that he believes that Messel may be responsible for Lauren's disappearance. In the first couple of years after, the Bloomington police received 3,600 tips and executed 10 search warrants, but as we know, nothing came of any of these. In the August after her disappearance, Robert and Charlene Spira had to watch as investigators searched a landfill for their daughter, a search which did turn up empty, but didn't make it any less painful for the parents. Imagine the pain of having to watch as your child is searched for amongst rubbish. Searchers scoured at least three lakes and combed through two forests. They looked through abandoned buildings and covered 99% of all Monroe County roads and most publicly accessible land within a 114 square mile radius. There's never been a single clue found. Charlene says they've come to terms with the fact that Lauren's probably not alive, but said to ABC News, I really just would like to hear, this is where you can find your daughter. It's the not knowing what happened to her, where she might be, it's unbearable. As painful as they are, at least with murder cases, you have closure, you know that you can mourn and begin to heal as much as you can. When it comes to missing people, you're stuck in this limbo for years with no answers, just speculation and mistrust. I do believe there's still a chance this case can be solved though, we've seen cases get solved a lot longer than a decade later, and it's never too late to bring peace to the family. There's so many chances here for this to be solved. The Spears, as I've said, have hired private investigators for this case, hiring Bo Dietl and Associates. The president of the company is Mike Cirovolo, who's spoken of their mistrust of Bloomington PD. Cirovolo stated to Fox 59 in just June of this year that Jesse Wolf has never been properly alibied to their satisfaction, that the men have never been very cooperative and that it's a distinct possibility that Lauren could have been taken by an opportunist on the street. He said when the PI service came into play around the end of summer 2011, they spent three weeks in Bloomington and interviewed a lot of important witnesses, 46 to 52 people in total. Most of these people said they'd never been approached by the police. Cervolo said, and I quote, The Bloomington police, upon our arrival, they were not happy to see us. They didn't seem to share in our enthusing, for this is a big case, we're here to help. We'll be happy to share anything we uncover with you. We're not here to steal anyone's thunder, we're here to help find Lauren. We don't get a warm reception, and we were met with kind of a stonewall. The chief of the Bloomington Police Department has never shown any cooperation towards us. However, the chief has insisted that they're still handling Lauren's case with as much care as they did in the early days. He said, Many times we were asked if Lauren's case is listed as a cold case. The answer to that is an unequivocal no. A cold case is a case where no information or leads have come in and the case file sits dormant. That has never been the case regarding Lauren and there has always been something to follow up on. He insists that they're still as committed to this case as they were in 2011. Anyone with any information about the disappearance of Lawrence Beera is asked to contact the Bloomington Police Department or PIs Bo Dietl and Associates, the numbers of which I'll include in the description box down below. You can also provide your tips via the findlauren.com website which will also be linked down below. Someone knows something here, and Charlene and Robert and the rest of Lauren's loved ones deserve to rest knowing their answers. They deserve to give their daughter a proper burial. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye, guys.